Thanks for Dr. Brustercheck. So it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about mutations in MF. And um, for me, as an ex-pathologist, it's remarkable to actually see the change in how we think about myelofibrosis and how we make the diagnosis, which is why I constructed this slide. This is like a um, homemade slide basically showing the myelofibrosis, the reticulin fibrosis that we saw on stain previously, and then um, sort of in the beginning of the 21st century is when we identified the JAK2 mutation, uh, going on to exon 12 and then the CALR, and then now with a whole smattering of uh, molecular lesions that have been identified one after the other. So it, it's sort of, it's very exciting because all these are new information that we sort of have to put um, into some kind of a clinical perspective and know how to use them in a clinical sense. Uh, and by the same token, it's giving us um, a tremendous amount to understand the impact on the disease biology and possibly identify potential targets for therapy. So I'm gonna talk about clonal markers in MF and then uh, talk a little bit about other molecular lesions in this entity, talk a little bit about what we know in terms of prognosis, uh, and also uh, what do we know about uh, mutations and therapy, including one slide about stem cell transplantation, and then hopefully arrive to some kind of a conclusion. And I hope that by attending this talk, you're not thinking that I'm gonna give you a bona fide answer to all of the above. This is more uh, sort of a, uh, a question and answer and a gut feeling towards the end. So it'd be great to actually get uh, somebody's feedback and input on what I'm about to say. Um, myelofibrosis is the rarest one of all. It's a, not a very common entity, uh, but it, it too is the one that's associated with the worst survival, as you can see here. And there had been a variety of prognostic systems that had been developed to understand survival and leukemia evolution, starting with the IPSS, which is very good uh, for this type of assessment at the time of diagnosis, moving on to the IPSS and the, the IPSS plus, uh, which actually is a dynamic and could be applied at any given point, point in time. So when I look at the pathology of MF, obviously you have several stages. You start with a, a prefibrotic stage or a cellular stage, and you go on to a complete fibrosis. And, um, and I think, again, there's a lot less known about the progression of the molecular mutation, and I'm not talking about JAK2, MIPL, or CALR. I'm talking about the other molecular mutations as they relate to disease progression as you see it pathologically. So more on that to come. Uh, let alone that when you have a disease that's so chronic, uh, it's really hard to study an individual patient, but maybe that would be the way to go so that you can study the progression of those mutation relative to disease duration and the type of pathology that you are dealing with at a given point in time. So how do we really apply uh, the mutations that have, have already been mentioned in a clinical sense? Well, if you look at the criteria for the diagnosis of MF according to the 2008 WHO, you'll see that the identification of a clone in the form of JAK2 or exon 12 or MIPL is extremely important. In fact, it's one of the three major diagnostic criteria. So no doubt about it, confirmation of the presence of a clone is extremely important in making a diagnosis. That's first and foremost. Most of those um, mutations that uh, have been mentioned are gain of function mutation that confer uh, basically um, independence from a growth factor which binds to the receptor and le uh, go on to uh, transduce the signal to the nucleus resulting in proliferation. Uh, but there had been other uh, mutations also that aren't necessarily gain of functions more uh, than uh, loss of function actually that we're gonna touch upon later. Uh, and in 2013, we, um, uh, two papers basically discussed the uh, identification of the CalR mutation, sort of closing the gap on the JAK2 negative patients who had ET and myelofibrosis. So now, if you looked at the group of patients that have MF, for example, all the way to the right, you'll find that most of them will have some evidence of a clone, and there's a very small proportion of patients who are uh, so-called as triple negative. In essence, you cannot identify a clone, but their bone marrow demonstrates significant fibrosis, hence the name. And I think this specific group merits further uh, exploration because it's really hard to, it's either that there is another mutation that is yet to be identified, or that this group of people probably belong to a different set of myeloid neoplasm, don't necessarily fit in this group of patients that we're discussing. Uh, this is a paper that was published last year, and it actually addressed the impact of those mutations that we've just 
uh, named relative to not only the prognosis and overall survival, but also the phenotype. So here they looked at, um, at greater than 600 patients that were taken from four different centers, and then they, um, a prerequisite for this study was that the, those patients had to have data at the time of diagnosis, such that they were able to calculate an IPSS, and then they had a sample from their DNA so that they can actually do the mutational testing. And then they sort of stratified them according to their survival. And you can see that people who are triple negative actually had the most dismal survival, 3.2 years, compared to those who were Cal R positive, which had the best prognosis. And actually, even when it comes to phenotype, there were some differences. So those who were Cal R positive tended to be a little bit younger. They tended to have less anemia, less leukocytosis, and less thrombotic event. Whereas those who uh, had triple negative tended to be older, more anemia, et cetera, uh, and then JECTO and MIPL sort of overlapped. So this is probably the very first study that, that kind of gave us a taste as to what you might be expecting with patients relative to those molecular markers. So then afterwards, you started to see a variety of other mutations, and again, um, the, discussing each and every mutation beyond the scope of this, but I get the feeling that you got a little bit of a taste of it in the morning session. Uh, and you can see all of them actually have been reported uh, with various uh, percentage or frequency in PV, in ET, in MF. As a matter of fact, uh, some of those mutations had also been reported in other myeloid neoplasm, like MDS, like AML, and some of them were actually identified in AML before they were identified in MPN. So you get the feeling, though, just looking at the primary myelofibrosis, that the percentages of some of those mutations are a little bit higher, all right? So, and again, it's really not known does the allele burden, let's say AXSL1, does that increase in time? And if you looked at people with PV uh, at some point in time and looked at 10 years later, would that be a little bit different? I think we need those sorts of data to kind of put this in perspective relative to the disease progression. But be it as it may, uh, some of the most common mutations, as you, you see here, are AXSL1, uh, TET2 mutation, and DNA methyltransferase 3A, among others. This is just an example of what ASXL1 gene looks like. Actually, this is a, a gene that's on chromosome 20, and as you know, deletion 20 is one of the most common uh, genetic events in myelofibrosis. And so what happens uh, with, this mu uh, with, with these mutations is that it's either deletion, related to deletion 20, or it's a nonsense of frame shift mutation. What happens is that you end up with a, a stop, stop codon, basically, and then uh, stop stopping the transcription of this specific protein and the loss of the PhD part, and presumably this is the part that's important for protein-protein interaction. So basically it's truncation of the transcription of that specific gene induced by the mutation. And the same thing can happen or had been described with TET2 and others. Um, so you can see that this is, re this is really complicated uh, um, genetic events that have to be really studied extensively. So um, it was, again, the Italian group that looked at patients who had MF, and again, they looked at a very large number of patients from Mayo Clinic, also from Italy, and then they started to try to understand what is the impact on the presence of those mutation in those patients, and um, studied one group, the Italian group, and then they went on and validated this um, molecular profile, if you will, in the Mayo Clinic group. And you can see that they were able to identify differences between what they labeled as high molecular risk group, and you can see the description of it basically if you looked at the title. So the presence of any one of those mutations basically identified a high molecular risk group, whereas those who didn't have any were basically considered low risk. And so if you compare the two population in this very large cohort, you can see that there's a significant difference in overall survival and also acute leukemia transformation. So you knew that it was only a matter of time until someone decides to include this molecular risk into the uh, prognostication when it comes to myelofibrosis. And actually, this was an abstract that was submitted or presented at last year's ASH, again from the same group, and trying to incorporate uh, a molecularly uh, flavored um, 
uh, genetic testing in this patient population incorporate, incorporate that into some kind of prognostic system. So how did they do that? Well, uh, they took a very large Italian cohort, 588 patients, and again, most of those data were taken at the time of diagnosis. They calculated the IPSS, um, and as, as you can see, actually depicted here is what we look for in the IPSS, and you can see how those patients were split four different ways. And this basically is the percentage of the mutation that they found. 63% of them were jacked to uh, positive, 20% CALR, and the rest, as you can see, about 20%. Actually, the ASXL1 is anywhere from 20 to 30%, depending on the group that you look for. And then the rest uh, uh, is, as you see, the SR, uh, SRF F2 is basically a spliceosome mutation that has been associated with the worst outcome in patients with myelofibrosis, unlike the SF3B, which is uh, portends for a better prognosis in patients with MDS and have RARS. So this is the construct of the uh, MIPS score, as uh, it's called, and all these variables were basically assigned scores, all right? Um, and this is basically how the groups um, were grouped uh, anywhere from zero to greater than four, identifying four different subsets, and this was applied to the um, cohort from Mayo Clinic, again, demonstrating that you have reasonable um, differentiation in the four risk scores. What I thought was interesting is that if you looked at the comparison between the IPSS and the MIPS scores in terms of prognostic discern discernibility, you can see that there's some degree of concordance when it comes to low risk. This is IPSS, and uh, here is the MIPS by colors. So 77% concordance for low risk group, although 17% of those patients belong to the INT1 according to the MIPS. And so basically these data are somewhat similar to what happened with the MDS study when you took the mutational analysis and you applied them to a different cohort, and then you showed that you could actually up the IPSS score, basically, and this is, in essence, uh, similar because here in the INT1, uh, you can see that about 65% of those people that were considered INT1 by the IPSS actually have INT2 by the MIPS. Why? Because of the presence of some of those mutations. So maybe this is important so that we can actually begin to understand the INT1 patient population. And I say that it's very interesting in terms of prognostic uh, uh, value of those um, lesions, but I'm not sure that we are to the point where we can say, okay, now we have to probably base therapy on this accordingly because we don't have any data suggesting that utilizing more aggressive therapies actually are um, better than what we are using right now. Again, having said that, it's not to say that there shouldn't be challenge in clinical trials, which would be forthcoming. So does the high molecular risk or low molecular risk matter when you're using uh, a JAK2 inhibitor. So these are uh, data that were published also in blood, um, and these are taken from the COMFORT-2 study, which uh, basically was um, a randomized study looking at best available therapy versus struxolitinib in INTO and high-risk MDS in Europe, and uh, it's the study that showed survival advantage. And so in this study, they went back and they decided to study mutations uh, in those people that were enrolled on the study. Okay, so these weren't newly diagnosed, those were people who received prior therapy, and we don't have that on all the patients, okay? It's almost 75% of the patients that were enrolled had a, a sample from the DNA that allowed for mutational testing. And here, you can see that uh, people who received roxolitinib, uh, whether they were low risk or high risk, didn't really have that much of a difference relative to those who receive best available therapy. You know, again, low risk, high risk. You can see that the high risk people did slightly worse. So, okay, you can argue that those patients weren't randomized according to their molecular risk, right? And also, if you look at the p-values, there may be a little bit of a difference because there was some overlap in the confidence intervals. So, but it's an interesting uh, publication showing that, well, maybe it doesn't really matter if you utilized uh, JAK2 inhibitors in this setting. Although, again, I would have liked to see randomization uh, prospective in that fashion to draw a, a more solid conclusion. 
Um, and interestingly, it didn't really matter in terms of responses, spleen response, constitutional symptoms, et cetera. So uh, the conclusion of the authors is that uh, roxolitany basically reduced the risk of death in people regardless of whether or not they had detrimental uh, molecular phenotype. Uh, this is a paper from Teferi, uh, Mayo Clinic group, and basically he did this in collaboration with the Italian group looking at what happens actually if you looked at the risk of people who have the best molecular mutation that is CalR, uh, plus minus AXSL1, which has been proven or shown to associate with the worst prognosis. So um, again, he looked at um, 189, um, well, he looked at a large number, 570 patients, right? And what I'm showing you here is actually the risk stratification or the survival of the people who have um, into and high-risk disease in the Mayo Clinic group. And it's clear that actually the trophy goes to people who are CalR positive and AXSL1 negative, okay? So this is a good uh, molecular uh, group to be in, whereas those who didn't have CalR and had AXSL1 tend to have the most dismal outcome. And again, risk stratifying people who are into and high-risk disease even further, depending on whether or not they have CalR and AXSL1. So when they applied this to the Italian group, uh, it, it too carried some weight, but this is everybody, okay? So here's your CalR, negative AXSL1 positive, still the worst outcome. The best outcome is CalR positive AXSL1 negative. So but what happened when you looked at the into and high risk disease patients in the Italian cohort? Here you can see that they were sort of trended for improvement, but not as clear as you saw it in the very first uh, graph that I had shown you. So here, I suppose the suggestion is that if you have a, young, uh, a patient who happened to have into and high risk MF and happened to be CalR positive, their outcome is reasonable. There is no reason, at least according to the authors, to consider transplantation in this patient population because their outcome isn't as terrible as it would be if they happen to be CalR negative and AXSL1 positive. Another interesting uh, take on it. And the same group, by the way, published data relative to treatment and the impact of this specific molecular profile I had mentioned uh, when using momolotinib, okay? And in this clinical study, it appeared that, and by the way, this was phase one and two clinical study in people who had um, myelofibrosis. About 20% of those people were treated with a different JAK inhibitor prior to being enrolled onto this clinical trial. So those were, it's a different patient population. It's a phase one slash two. And here you can see that it didn't really matter whether or not they had a better or worse molecular profile relative to the treatment. So they still um, had a significant impact of an AXSL1 despite therapy. And I think really to make any sense out of treatment and the impact of mutations relative to certain JAK inhibitors, you need prospective um, uh, randomized head-to-head -head trials looking at the, to answer that question. This was by no means a comparison between the two drugs, and that's important to realize. What about allogeneic transplantation? This is, again, a recent article from the German group. And in here, they looked at 70 patients that had allo transplant, and then they looked at the frequency of spliceosome mutations. Because, you know, a lot of times people said, well, CalR mutations have a very good prognosis because they have very little spliceosome mutations, and some of those are associated with the worst outcome. So in here, after about a year and a half of follow-up, they identified four patients uh, that had relapsed uh, post-transplant. And what's interesting here is that you can see how some of those spliceosome mutations never went away. This is pre and this is post-transplant. So 50% still uh, persistent. And again, in this patient, pre and post continue to persist. So again, it's going to be very interesting to see in a longitudinal prospective fashion that in, if you used even the most aggressive uh, treatment, basically allogeneic stem cell transplantation, are we actually altering those mutations? And in the hands of those authors, it would appear that the, the pattern of relapse and some of the molecular alterations come back differently. In essence, you may have multi-clones that may you know, start to um, grow post-transplantation. So again, preliminary data, data and more on that to come. Um, one thing that I'd like to say about these mutations is that even though it's an amazing 
uh, the, uh, body of data suggesting that the presence of some of those mutations can portend for a very poor prognosis, it, it actually nags me that they had been identified in a seemingly normal population. So this is, I'm sure you've seen uh, data. There were two papers in that same New England of Journal uh, Medicine um, journal, basically, in 2014, that talked about massive uh, a number of patients, actually not patients, healthy adults, but older adults that had perfectly normal white count, and they were basically uh, screened for certain mutations that are known to occur in heme malignancies. And so what happened is that the percentage of those mutations rose with age. So then age in by itself, irrespective of any molecular, uh, of any disease or heme disease, causes you to acquire mutations. So you're gonna say, well, what kind of mutations did they develop? Well, the most common, DNA methyltransferase, TET2, and AXSL1. And those are the mutations that tend to uh, have the most frequency in heme malignancies. And so, so are these surrogate for aging? Are they surrogate for some other comorbid conditions or something that might predispose their, those patients to develop heme malignancies? I think that's going to be another very interesting question. So I think, uh, in conclusion, I told you I wasn't going to give you too many answers, but I think there are certain answers that you know we can say with confidence that identifying a clone in the setting of an, a suspicion for MPN will confirm the diagnosis for you. It might actually give you some prognostic um, frame of reference as to how to treat the patient, as how to monitor the patient when it comes to treatment. I think it's a little bit iffier. Uh, we might be able to use the MPS, the MIP score for better discerning prognostic uh, value. And maybe when, you, when it comes to transplantation, this may uh, somewhat be helpful in identifying the patient that will uh, benefit from this treatment. The hurdles is the fact that they can be identified in the normal population, that they're not specific for a specific um, heme malignancy, could be identified across a whole um, spectrum of heme malignancies, and that we really don't know much about the acquisition or the causes of those molecular lesions to develop, and how do they change relative to disease duration. Uh, and of course, we need more data um, when it comes to a response to therapy. In my opinion, I think what we need is a, is a prospective multi-step evaluation of the molecular lesions in MF patients, and I know that the NPN Research Consortium is embarking on something like this, so that we're collecting samples from uh, patients who are basically being enrolled on clinical trials, and maybe that would be one way that you can really identify what happens as those patients go on for years with this treatment, and how is treatment impacting the evolution of those molecular lesions. Uh, as I've already alluded to it, um, impact of aging, disease duration on those molecular profiles would be very important. But you know, I think the challenge to us is to, un is to understand really what does the CalR mutation do? How do people develop MPN when they have the CalR? What does SRSF2 mean? And what is actually the, the target, the molecular targets that maybe therapeutic agents or even uh, strategies could be developed according? But I do think that that's the harder question to answer. So I think with that, I'll conclude, and thank you for listening.